Chapter 9, Unit 3. Let's talk about how we measure effect size for a t-test. So a hypothesis determines whether the treatment effect is greater than chance, where chance is measured by standard error. It's possible for a very small treatment effect to be statistically significant if the sample size is really large. So to correct for this, it's recommended that reports from a hypothesis test also be accompanied by a report of effect size. In your problems and on your test, you should only compute effect size if the hypothesis test is significant. If it's not significant, then there's no need for an effect size because there's no effect at all. So our first effect size we're going to use is we're going to estimate Cohen's D. Um, you guys already know from the last chapters that Cohen's D is equal to the mean difference over standard deviation. And you've got a calculation of M minus mu over population standard deviation. Well, for this chapter, we're going to estimate D and we're going to say M minus mu over S, which is the standard deviation for a sample. When we talk about effect size, if you end up with a D of 0.2, that's a small effect. Somewhere around 0.5 would be a medium effect, and somewhere around 0.8 would be a large effect. Let's look at an example of Cohen's D. So let's look at the appearance of a 15-point treatment in two different situations. So let's look at part A, which is the graph at the top. Notice on the left, it tells you the distribution of SAT scores before treatment is a mean of 500 with a standard deviation of 100. And then the distribution of SAT scores after treatment is a mean of 515 with a standard deviation of 100. So if you look at the standard deviation, it's still 100, but there's a 15 point effect. The mean used to be 500. After treatment, the mean's now 515. Well, let's calculate D, Cohen's D. You would say 515 minus 500 over 100. The standard deviation is 0.15, which is pretty small. Now let's look at part B. Notice that this is the distribution of IQ scores before treatment with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And then after treatment, the distribution of, I score, of IQ scores after treatment would be a mean of 115 and a standard deviation of 15. Okay, so there's still a 15 point effect. The old mean was 100, the new mean is 115. So if you're going to calculate D, you'd say 115 minus 100 over the standard deviation, which is now 15 for the second example, and you'd get D equals 1, which is really large. Okay, so the smaller standard deviation gave us a much larger effect. And so Cohen's D uses standard deviation to help measure effect size. Let's look at an example. For a bedtime reading study, the participants average M equals 46 on an alertness scale. If the light emitting e-reader has no effect, as stated by the null hypothesis, then the population mean would be mean equals 50. Thus, the results show a four point difference. That means M minus mu is equal to four points. The standard the variance for the sample was found to be S squared equals 20.25. Find Cohen's D. All right, well, in order to find Cohen's D, you have to know the equation is D is equal to M minus mu over S. Well, we need to find S. So S is actually just the square root of S squared, which they gave us. So we can find S, the standard deviation, equal to 4.5. Then we can find Cohen's D. So plug in 46 minus 50 over 4.5 you get a negative 0.89, but in Cohen's D, you always change your answer to positive. You cannot have a negative Cohen's D, so the answer would be positive 0.89. So Cohen's D is always changed to be a positive number. You need to remember that. From the Cohen's D table that we looked at before, that's several slides back, you know that 0.89 is a large effect size. Anything 0.8 or more is large. Let's look at a second example. We have 16 individuals selected from a population with a mean of 40. The treatment is administered, and then after treatment, the sample has a mean of 44 and a variance of 16. Use a two-tail test with alpha 
to determine whether the treatment effect is significant. And if it is, then I want you to compute Cohen's D to measure the effect size of the treatment effect. So step one, you need to list your hypotheses. It's a two-tailed test, so the mean either equals 40 or the mean does not equal 40. Step two, you're told that N is 16. That means degrees of freedom would be 15. So go to your table using degrees of freedom 15, alpha 0.05, two-tailed, you should find critical values of plus and minus 2.131. Remember, draw your chart, your graph, so that you can see that you need two tails. You need to make one positive and one negative. Step three, you're going to do your calculations. You're going to calculate your t-score. First step to that is to find sample variance. They gave you the sample variance of 16. Uh, you could use that, or you could go ahead and find your sample standard deviation, which in this case would be four. To do estimated standard error, you could just use the variance equation, which is S square root of S squared over N. You find estimated standard error to be one. And then you can use your T calculation, M minus mu over the estimated standard error. You would end up with plus four. So put an X on the graph. You definitely are going to reject the graph. There is a significant treatment effect. So in order to find the treatment effect, remember Cohen's D requires standard deviation, which is why I found standard deviation up there in the very first calculation for T. So you plug in M minus mu over your sample standard deviation, which you'd found to be four, and you would get one, which is a very large effect size. So the results indicate that the treatment had a significant effect. T of 15 is equal to four, the probability is less than 0.05, D equals one. Let's look at example three. A psychologist would like to determine if there's a relationship between depression and aging. It's known that the general population averages a mean of 40 on a standardized depression scale. The psychologist obtains a sample of nine individuals who are all more than 70. And here's the depression scores. They're listed here. On the basis of this sample, is depression for elderly people significantly different from depression in the general population? Use a two-tailed test with alpha 0.05, and then if it's significant, compute Cohen's D to measure the size of the difference, and then write a sentence showing the outcome of the hypothesis test and the measure of the effect size, how they would appear in a research report. All right, so step one, write the hypothesis. It's a two-tail, so the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis. So the null would be mean equals 40. The research would be mean is not equal to 40. Step two, you're gonna use n equals nine. So that gives you degrees of freedom of eight. You're gonna to go to your tables and find critical values of 2.306. Draw your picture, put in the positive and negative critical values. The next step, you're gonna calculate T. Well, this is a little bit harder. Um, to calculate T, we have to know the variance. To know the variance, we have to know the mean and other things. So we're gonna start at the very beginning. We're gonna find the mean of this sample. So we're gonna make a column with all the X scores, and we're gonna make an X column, and we're gonna add them up. You should get 396, and there's nine scores. So your mean would be 396 over nine, which would be 44. Then you're gonna find sum of squares. Well, to find sum of squares, remember you need not only an X column, but you need an X squared column. So you're going to make an x squared column. You're going to square, square every score and then add it up. And then you're going to put the two sums that you got into the SS equation. So the summation of x squared minus summation of x squared over n. Fill in the numbers and you should end up with 162. Now that you have your sum of squares, now you can find your variance. S squared is equal to SS over DS. So it gives you 162 over eight, which gives you 20.25. Then you can find S, which is the standard deviation, which is just the square root of 20.5. That gives you 4.5. Then you can find your estimated standard error. And since you already have S, you could just use that equation, S over square root of N, you should get 1.5. And finally, you can plug it into the T equation. You have everything you need. And you should get T equals 2.67. Put an X on the graph where it goes. Your decision for step four is to reject the null. There is a significant treatment effect, so you are gonna calculate Cohen's D, which is M minus mu over S. You already have found S, so you plug in what you found and you should get 
So the results indicate that depression scores for the elderly are significantly different from scores for the general population. T of eight equals 2.67, probability is less than 0.05, with the D equal to 0.889. Now we're going to talk about R squared, which is a different measure of effect size. This is called measuring the percentage of variance explained by the treatment. So if a treatment causes scores to increase or decrease, then it will also cause scores to vary. If we measure how much variability is obtained by this treatment, then we can obtain a measure of the size of the treatment effect. So look at this example. The shift from a population mean of 50 over to a sample mean of 46, that would be the treatment effect. There's four points difference, okay? So that's why we're gonna look at how much variance, how much, how much shifting is done. So the way we do this is we use an R squared equation. R squared is equal to T squared over T squared plus DF. And this is your calculated T. Um, when you're interpreting R squared, the percentage of variance explained, if R squared is 0.01, it's a very small effect. 0.09 would be a medium effect, and 0.25 would be a large effect. So while sample size affects the outcome of a hypothesis test, notice that it has little or no effect at all on effect size. The sample variance, however, does influence hypothesis tests and it influences all measures of effect size. The lower the variance, the more likely you will be to obtain a significant outcome and reject the null hypothesis. The higher the variance, then the lower the measure of effect size. Let's look at an example. So these people reported on the effects of preschool children on the development of young children. One result suggests that children who spend more time away from their mothers are more likely to show behavioral problems in kindergarten. So using a standardized scale, the average rating of behavioral problems for kindergarten children is a mean of 35. So these researchers took a sample of 16 kindergarten children who had spent at least 20 hours per week in child care the previous year, and these children had a mean score of 42.7 with a standard deviation of 6. Are the data sufficient to conclude that children with a history of child care show significantly more behavioral problems than the average kindergarten child? I want you to use a one-tail test with alpha 0.01. I want you to compute R squared, the percentage of variance accounted for, to measure the size of the preschool effect. And then write a sentence showing how the outcome of the hypothesis test and the measure of effect size would appear in a report. So step one. Again, we're talking about a one-tail test, so you always write the research hypothesis first. You always write H1 first. So in this case, the question says, is it sufficient to conclude that children with a history of childcare show significantly more behavior problems? So more is on the greater than side, the higher than side of the graph. So your research hypothesis would be the mean is greater than 35. And then the null hypothesis would just be the opposite. It is less than or equal to 35. Step two, you're gonna say your degrees of freedom. So you're gonna find that to be 15. And you're gonna go to your critical tables. You're gonna draw a picture and you're gonna label the critical score of 2.602. And they just said more behavioral problems. So we only care about the high positive side in this graph. It's a one tail test. Then you're gonna do your calculations. You're given S. So let's use the equation for estimated standard error of S over square root of N. That's gonna give you 1.5. Then you can put that straight into your T equation. You should get a T of 5.13. You're gonna put an X on the graph and you're gonna do your result. And in this case, you're gonna reject the hypothesis. Finally, the next step you're gonna do is you're gonna say what variance is accounted for by this treatment. So you're gonna use the equation and remember the T that you used is not a critical value. You put in T that you calculated. So T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. And remember, do the entire bottom of the fraction first before you divide. So you're gonna end up with 0.637 or most people just say 63.7% of the variance is accounted for by the treatment. And then you would write it like this. The results show that kindergarten children with the history of daycare have significantly more behavioral problems 
than other kindergarten children. T of 15 is equal to 5.13, probability less than 0.01, one tail, R squared equals 0.637. Now we're going to talk about confidence intervals. This is another way to estimate the mean. You're going to estimate a population mean after treatment. So basically we want to know the entire middle of the distribution. We want to know what, that we're going to be confident that the mean after tra treatment is going to be expected to be a particular value. So for example, if the mean before treatment is mean equals 80 and the mean after treatment is estimated to be mean equals 86, then we would know that the treatment effect is going to be around six points. So a confidence interval is a range of values that's centered around a sample statistic, and we can estimate that the value of the, of the parameter should be located within that interval. So the equation we use is m is equal to plus or minus t times estimated standard error. And when you use confidence intervals, no matter what you've done for the problem before, you're going to always draw a new graph. It's always going to be a two-tail test, and you're going to find the t value is always going to come from the tables for a confidence interval. So just remember, confidence intervals are always two tails. The larger the sample size, the smaller the confidence interval. So let's look at an example of a confidence interval. A sample of nine participants, again reading from an e-reader for 15 minutes, had a score of m equals 46 the next morning with a mean of 50. Um, the data produced an estimated standard error of 1.5. Construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean alertness score for the population. All right, to do a confidence interval, you always do a two-tail. Okay. And you have to realize that when you're doing this and when you're looking for the tables for the t value, a 95% confidence interval means alpha level is 0.05 or the other 5%. So they won't tell you alpha level. You'll have to know it's the other percentage that's not in the confidence interval. So in this case, you're going to draw the picture. You're going to look in the tables for degrees of freedom, which would be eight for this problem, two tails, alpha 0.05, and you're going to find t-scores of plus and minus 2.306. Again, there's your confidence interval equation. I always split it into two parts. I do the negative side first. So I would put in 46 minus 2.306 times 1.5. And then the second equation, I would do 46 plus 2.306 times 1.5. So my confidence interval would actually go from 42.54 to 49.459, and that should say 95% confidence interval. Notice that the mean of 46 is exactly in the middle of this confidence interval, pretty close. Let's look at another example. Standardized measures seem to indicate that the average level of anxiety has increased gradually over the past 50 years. In the 1950s, the average score on the child manifest anxiety scale was 15.1, a sample of 16 of today's children produces a mean score of 23.3 with SS equal to 240. Based on the sample, has there been a significant change in the average level of anxiety since the 1950s? Use a two-tail test with alpha equal 0.01. And then part B, make a 90% confidence interval estimate of today's population mean level of anxiety. And part C, write a sentence that would appear in the research report. So step one, it's a two-tail test. So the mean is either equal to 15.1 or it's not equal to 15.1. Step two, find the degrees of freedom, which would be 15. Using that degrees of freedom, alpha 0.01 and two tail, find the critical values in the tables. So your picture would look like the one on the right here. It would be a two tail test. The critical values would be 2.947, both positive and negative side. And step three, you're gonna calculate T. Well, if you look at the T equations, T is equal to M minus mu over estimated standard error. Well, I know M and I know mu, but I don't know estimated standard error. So let's look at the estimated standard error equation. Well, that would equal S over square root of N. Well, I know N, but I don't know S. So let's look at the S equation. S would be square root of SS over DF. Ah, things that I know. So let's solve for S first. So we know the sum of squares is 240. We know degrees of freedom is 15. And you'll be able to find an S or standard deviation equal to 4. Then you'll be able to put that answer into your estimated standard error equation of S over square root of N. 
to get an estimated standard error of 1. Finally, you'll be able to put that into your t equation, which will give you 8.2. Let's put an x on the graph to indicate where the calculated t would be. And at 8.2, it is way out on the far right side. So you're going to definitely reject the null hypothesis. All right, part two, you're going to do a confidence interval. You're going to draw a completely different graph. You're going to find out what numbers are in the middle 90%. So this is a 90% confidence interval. So what that means is that in the tails, there's 10% in the tails. So you're going to draw your picture. You're going to look at the tables. Again, your degrees of freedom is still 15 because there's still 16 children in the sample. So that's the same as the original problem. But the alpha level, again, is 0 0.10. It's different than the original problem, so be careful on that. You're going to use a two-tail test to find t for use in the confidence interval equation. And again, your confidence interval is going to be m plus or minus the critical t times the estimated standard error. So plug in the values, and remember in the confidence interval, you have to use the values you obtained from the table. And the table values you obtained for the confidence interval were plus and minus 1.753. I used the minus one first and do 23 minus 1.753 times 1 to give me 21.547. And then I used the plus side second to give me 25.053. That gives me a 90% confidence interval that goes from 21.547, and then you'd put a comma, all the way to 25.053. And then you're finally, you write your sentence. Your sentence would say, the data indicate a significant change in the level of anxiety. T of 15 is equal to 8.2. Probability is less than 0.01. And the 90% confidence interval would go from 21.547 to 25.053. Learning check problem one. A sample of n equals 25 is selected from a population with a mean of 40 and a treatment is administered. After treatment, the sample mean is found to be 44 with a sample variance of 100. Based on this information, what's the size of the treatment effect as measured by Cohen's D? Okay, so in order to do Cohen's D calculation, you have to have the sample standard deviation of S. So the S calculation is just the square root of S squared, so square root of 100, which would be 10. And then we can find Cohen's D, which is M minus mu over S, and that would give you 0.4. So that's about a medium effect size. Let's look at learning check problem two. So a sample selected from a population with a mean of 75 and a treatment is administered. The sample mean is M equals 79. Then which of the following outcomes would produce the largest value for Cohen's D? Well, the difference between A, B, and C is just sample size. N is 4, then N is 16, then N is 25. And variance is the same for all three. It's all 330. And answer D says all three samples would produce the same value for Cohen's D. Well, let's go back to sample A and let's look at the calculation for Cohen's D. So for Cohen's D, you have to know S. So the first thing we do is we find S, the sample standard deviation, which is the square root of S squared, which would give us 5.48. And then we would find Cohen's D, M minus mu over S, we'd get 0.73, a large effect size. And if we repeated these calculations for answers B and C, you'd find the exact same answer because Cohen's D only depends on S. It does not depend on the sample size. So your answer for this one would be D. All three samples would produce the same value for Cohen's D. Let's look at learning check problem three. A sample of four scores is selected from a population with an unknown mean. The sample has a mean of 40 and a variance of 16. Which of the following is the correct 90% confidence interval for the mean? Well, to do a 90% confidence interval, remember that means the other 10% is in the tails. So that means alpha is 0 0.10. So you're going to look in your tables for degrees of freedom is 3, alpha 0 0.01, two tail. Because remember, confidence intervals are always two tail. And you're going to find which t to use in the confidence interval equation. You should find a t of 2.353. Okay, draw your picture. 
And then remember that the confidence interval equation is m plus and minus t times the estimated standard error. Well, in order to find estimated standard error, you have to use s squared, which we already know, over n, and then take the square root. So you would get 2. So finally, your confidence interval equation would look like this, 40 plus or minus 2.353 times 2. And are any of your answer choices like that? Yes, answer C is like that. Learning check problem four. A researcher uses a sample of 25 individuals to evaluate the effect of a treatment. The hypothesis test uses an alpha level of 0.05 and produces a significant result with T is equal to 2.15. How would you report this result in the literature? Well, first off, you know you use T of the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom for this problem would be 24. So you know your answer was either gonna be B or D. Finally, it says it produces a significant effect in the problem. That means that the probability would be less than the alpha level. So you need to find an equation here, T of 24 equals 2.15, where the probability is less than 0.05, because less than means it's significant. So your answer choice would be B.